In this lecture, we're going to look at Hooke's Law and some further more complex circular motion examples. So the textbook references for this lecture are Halliday, Resnick and Walker, parts of section 7.4 and section 6.3. So first of all, a quick recap of the most important ideas in the, from the last lecture. In the last lecture, we were learning about Newton's laws. So we saw Newton's second law that the net force on the body is equal to the product of the body's mass and its acceleration, which is just often written as F is equal to MA. And by F, we mean the sum of all the forces that are acting on the body. And we saw Newton's third law that for every action there is an opposite and equal reaction. And then we solved problems involving Newton's three laws. So Hooke's law can be used to describe the force on objects such as springs. Hooke's law can be written as the force is equal to minus k, where k is some constant, times d, where d is the displacement from the equilibrium position. So the negative sign here indicates that the force is directed back towards the equilibrium position in the opposite direction to the displacement. So for a spring, k is known as the spring constant and is different for different springs. D is the distance from the equilibrium position. And as we've said, the negative sign indicates that this force is directed back towards the equilibrium position, which means it's a restoring force. So we're now considering a hanging mass on a spring. We're first of all asked to draw a free body diagram for a mass M, which is hanging at rest on the spring with a spring constant K. And the spring extends the length D when the mass is placed on it. Okay, so we've got our spring like this and then it extends a distance D with the mass on it. So the forces acting on the mass We've got the weight force pulling it down. Now it's at rest, so that tells us that, that the net force is zero. So we also have an upwards force, and this is the spring force, which is given by KD, because D here is the displacement of this spring from its equilibrium position. So part two then asks us to write an expression for the acceleration of the mass when it is pulled down a further distance y and then released. Okay, so at this point it's at rest. So we can say, well, ma is equal to minus ky. And so the acceleration is equal to minus ky on m. So the negative sign shows that the acceleration is back towards the equilibrium position. Now part three says, what is the maximum distance the mass can be pulled down if a coin placed on top of it is not to lose contact with the mass during its motion? Okay, so the point where the coin is most likely to lose contact with the mass on the spring is right up the top of its motion. At the top of its motion, the acceleration is directed down back towards the equilibrium position. And if it accelerates greater than G, if a is greater than g, then the coin's acceleration, which is just due to the weight force pulling it down, is going to be less than the acceleration of that hanging mass, which is also being pulled by the spring. So we need that ky on m has to be less than g, which tells us that y has to be less than mg on k. Okay, so question, does a mass on the spring obey the kinematic equations? Well, the answer to this question is no. The kinematic equations only apply when we have constant acceleration. So kinematic Hooke's law tells us that the force, which is the mass times acceleration, is equal to minus kx, where x is the displacement from equilibrium. So this is not a constant. It varies with the displacement. So next question, we're considering a loop-the-loop, -loop, and we're asked to list the forces acting on the car at the top of the loop, and do not include the resultant forces. So there was a list of forces that we could choose from. Up the top here, we've got the weight force pulling it down. So we've got the weight force 
We've also got the normal reaction force from the track. And we're told to not include the resultant forces. So we should not include the centripetal force because that occurs because of a result of these two. So these two will add together to give us our centripetal force. It's not a force which is actually acting on that car. So in this question, we're asked, what is the minimum speed of a car with mass m can have at the top of a loop with a radius r and remain in contact with the loop. Okay, so the car's coming down and it's doing a loop the loop. So let's consider the forces, which we've just discussed, acting on the car at the top of the loop. Well, we've got its weight force pulling it down. We've also got the normal force pulling it down. And as a result of this, it's undergoing circular motion. So the resultant force the sum of the forces is equal to mv squared on r, the centripetal force, towards the center, which is also down. Now, it's just going to lose contact when the normal force is zero. So we can write, well, the resultant force mv squared on r down is equal to mg plus n. Both these are going down. So I've left off all my negative signs because everything here is down. And so we're going to put n equals 0 in here. So this tells me that mv squared on r is equal to mg. And so we've got v squared is equal to rg. So v is equal to the square root of rg. So this is the speed at the top of the track which is actually slightly less than the speed it would have at the bottom, but we will learn about that in a later topic. So after trying this problem, you may want to try homework set 2, question 5 for 1121, or question 5 for 1131 as well. So the problem is, a daredevil motorcyclist attempts a loop-the-loop -loop trick. The combined mass of the motorcyclist and the motorcycle is 150 kilograms. The track he performs on has a radius of 2.7 meters. If the motorcyclist has a velocity of minus 6.00i meters per second at the top of the loop, does he manage to make it around the loop, assuming nothing goes unpredictably wrong? And two, what is the normal force on the motorcyclist and motorcycle at the top of the loop? So in this question, we're told that the motorcyclist tries to undergo a loop the loop. So let's just draw a diagram. Here's the loop the loop. Now at the top, his speed v is equal to 6.0i, it's negative i, so it's going in a negative direction, meters per second, and that's when he is up here. And part one of the question asks us, well, does he make it round the loop? So in order to make it round the loop, we need to satisfy the condition that the velocity has to be greater than the square root of gr. We're told that the radius of this loop is equal to 2.7 meters, and we'll need the mass later, so let's write it down. The mass is equal to 150 kilograms. That's for the motorcyclist plus the motorcycle. Okay, so let's calculate what velocity is required in order to just make it round the loop. So V is equal to the square root of GR, so 9.8 times 2.7. Solving this on the calculator, we get 5.14 meters per second. So as 6 meters per second is greater than 5.14 meters per second, the motorcyclist does make it all the way around the loop. Now, in part two, we're asked what's the normal force of the track on the motorcyclist and the motorcycle at the top of the loop. Okay, so in order to do that, let's draw on our different forces. So we've got our weight force, which is acting down. That's mg. I've done that blue. We've got our normal reaction force. I've drawn that green, also acting down, and that's the normal force. So it's perpendicular to the surface. And then we've also got our resultant force, which is our centripetal force. 
which is acting downwards towards the centre, because it's centripetal motion and that always acts towards the centre, and that's given by mv squared on r. So Newton's second law tells us that the sum of the forces is equal to ma, and for the centripetal course, force, this ma is equal to mv squared on r. So the sum of the forces have to be equal to this, so the two forces acting on him are n plus mg. And what we're trying to do is find this normal force here. So all these forces are directed down. So let's rearrange it and we've got normal is equal to mv squared on r minus mg down. So we can pull m out. So we've got mv squared on r minus g. So now we can substitute in. We've got 150 times v squared which he's going at 6 meters per second, so that's 6 squared over 2.7 minus g, which is 9.8. And solving this on the calculator, we get 530 newtons. Now, we should give this in unit vector notation. So it's in the downwards direction. If we've called this direction i, then upwards is j, and since it's going down, it'll be minus j. So um, the normal force... is n is equal to minus 530 j newtons. So we're now going to look at banked curves. Have you ever wondered why on racing car tracks the curves which the cars undertake are often banked? Well now we're going to find out why. So this question is what angle does a curve with radius r need to be banked at to prevent a car with speed v from moving up or down it and we're going to assume that friction is negligible. So let's draw our little diagram here. So here's our curve banked at an angle theta. Here's our car on the curve. Now the car is heading out of the screen towards us. Let's draw our free body diagram. So we've got a weight force mg pulling it down. We have a normal force from the track pushing it up away from the track and now as a result of these two forces the car is traveling around in a circle and so it's got a centripetal force mv squared on r which i've drawn red here because it's the resultant it's not actually part of our free body diagram okay now in order to work out what's going on it'll help to split our forces up into components now in this case because the centripetal force is horizontal and the weight force is down, we're actually going to split everything up into down and horizontal. So let's split the normal force here into two components, up and horizontal. Now hopefully you can see if this is angle theta here, we've got angle theta in here. And so this one here is n sine theta, and here we've got n cos theta. Now what we'll do is we'll apply Newton's law to the vertical and the horizontal forces. So apply Newton's second law and we've got vertically net force is zero. So we know that because the car is not flying off into space or sinking down into the track. So vertically these two forces must be equal. We've got zero is equal to n cos theta minus mg so this is up this is down so we can rearrange this and write well n cos theta is equal to mg so we can write n is equal to mg over cos theta horizontally we've got that we do have a resultant force which is this centripetal force so we've got mv squared on r that's our ma our resultant force and then the weight force doesn't have any horizontal component but we do for the normal force have a component n sine theta now what we're trying to do is find theta let's substitute in from up here for n so we've got mg sine theta over cos theta and sine theta over cos theta, that's tan theta. So we can write this as mg tan theta. So what we're trying to do is find theta. So let's write, well, tan theta is equal to mv squared on r divided by mg. The m's will cancel out. And so this tells us that theta is equal to the inverse tan of v squared on rg. 
So now if we know the speed of the cars on the track and the radius, we can work out which angle it should ideally be banked at. So with this example, we have a coin slides around a funnel shaped track and at one point it's traveling with a speed of one meter per second around part of a curve banked at 60 degrees with a radius of 20 centimeters. And we want to know, does the coin move up or down the track? So let's, as always, start by drawing our little diagram. This is banked at 60 degrees. Here's our coin sliding around the track. So it's coming out of the screen towards us. Let's draw the forces acting on it. We've got the weight force, which is acting down, and we've got the normal force, which is acting perpendicular to the track. Now we also have, well, as a result of these two forces, we have a resultant force acting on this coin. And we want to know, is the resultant force down the track like this, or is it like this? Which one of these is the solution? We know it will have a component to the left because it is undergoing centripetal acceleration. So it does have a horizontal component. So let's break our normal force here into two components. We'll break it into a vertical component. So this is theta in here, which is 60 degrees. And this is n cos theta. And then we've also got our horizontal component, n sine theta. So horizontally, we know that it's going around in a circle. So we've got horizontally, the resultant force MA is given by MV squared on R. And the weight force doesn't have any horizontal component, but the normal force does. So this must be equal to N sine theta, which tells us that well, N is equal to MV squared over R sine theta. Now vertically, we don't know what's happening. This is what we're trying to find because this is going to let us know if it's going up or down the slope. And so we've got MA, the resultant force, is equal to MG, which is down minus N cos theta. So this is the resultant down the slope. So let's replace this N with this. So we've got MV squared over R sine theta times cos theta. And so we can write this is equal to mg minus mv squared over r tan theta, replacing sine theta on cos theta with tan theta, and that's equal to ma. So we can cancel out the m's, and so we've got our acceleration is equal to g minus v squared r tan theta, and this is down the slope. So let's substitute in, we've got g's 9.8, we've got our speed we're told is one, so this is one squared. We've got divide by the radius, which is 0 0.20 meters times tan 60. And so solving this, we end up with 6.9 meters per second per second down. So this is telling us that it's going to move down the slope. And so it will eventually go through the hole in the middle. So this question is about a conical pendulum. So a conical pendulum is a pendulum that traces out a circular path. And we're asked to derive an expression for the tension in a con conical pendulum when the bob of mass m moves on the string of length l at speed v, tracing out a path with radius r. So let's sketch a little diagram. Here's our string, which has got some tension t in it. Here's our bob, it's got a weight force mg acting down, and let's let this be angle theta. Now there's two ways that we can think about this. We've got the forces here, but we can also consider the displacements. So we know that our string has a length l, this is meant to be the same angle theta here, and that the radius of this circular path here is given by r. So this is the displacement picture. Now these forces result in a resultant force towards the center, mv squared on r, which is the centripetal force. So this force comes about because of the sum of this force and this force. So considering the horizontal forces here, we can say horizontally, Well, mg does not contribute 
but we can split this tension force into a vertical and a horizontal component. So the horizontal component is given by T sine theta, and that is equal to mv squared on r. And here we can write, well, sine theta is equal to opposite over adjacent, so that's r over l. So we can substitute this in here. So we've got that T times R over L is equal to MV squared on R, which tells us that T is equal to MV squared over R squared, and then we've got an L up here. And so if V decreased, what would happen to the path traced out by the bob? Well, as T decreased, the centripetal acceleration is going to decrease, so the radius is going to get smaller. So a vertical spring is initially stationary with a one kilogram mass on the end. So this tells us that at this point, because it's stationary, the forces are balanced. The spring constant of the spring is 50 newtons per meter. The mass is pulled 10 centimetres below this initial position and it's held stationary at this point and then released at t equals zero. And in part one we're asked what is the net force on the mass. So initially there was no net force and then it was pulled down. So the net force is going to be due to the spring constant. So the net force is going to be minus kx. And so substituting in, we've got K is equal to 50 newtons per meter, and X, the displacement, is 10 centimeters below the initial position. So that's minus 0 0.10. And so this is equal to 5.0 newtons, and this is up. So we know it's up because it's in the opposite direction to the displacement from the equilibrium. So since it was pulled down, the net force is up. And then we're asked, what is the acceleration of the mass at t equals zero seconds? So we can use, well, f is equal to ma, that's Newton's second law. And so the acceleration is equal to f on m. So this is equal to five divided by one. And so this is equal to five meters per second per second up. So in this problem, part of a road in the snowy mountains is prone to be covered in ice during winter. It is a curved road and has a radius of curvature of 200 meters. So the radius is 200 meters and it's banked at an angle of 20 degrees. What speed in kilometers per hour would you advise a traffic controller was the maximum safe speed for a car to travel along this road and why? Okay, so icy road, so we should neglect friction. So let's draw a diagram of our banked road here. It's banked at an angle of 20 degrees. Here's a car traveling out of the screen towards us. The forces on the car, it's got its weight force down. It's got the normal reaction force. There's no frictional force, but the resultant force, the sum of this one and this one is going to be towards the center like that, given by mv squared on r. Now, what we can do is split our normal force into components vertical and horizontal. So here we've got theta, which is the 20 degrees. So this one here is n cos theta, and here we've got our n sine theta. So we can see that horizontally, there is no contribution from the weight force because that's a vertical force. And so we must have mv squared on r is equal to n sine theta. And so this tells us that v squared is equal to n sine theta r over m. Now, we don't know what the normal force is, so let's consider the vertical forces. So vertically, we don't want any net force. If there was a net force, our car would be moving up or down the slope. And so we will want mg is equal to n cos theta. So this tells us that n is equal to mg over cos theta. So we can now substitute that up into this expression. So we've now got mg times sine theta r over m cos theta. So these m's cancel out 
and sine theta over cos theta is tan theta. So this is gr tan theta. So this tells us that v squared is equal to gr tan theta, which is 9.8 times 200 times tan of 20, which is equal to 713. So using our calculator, we get v is equal to 26.7 meters per second. And so we need to give this in kilometers per hour. So we multiply by 3.6 and this gives this is equal to 96 kilometers per hour as the maximum speed so if it went faster than this then the normal force is no longer able to apply enough force to match this resultant inwards centripetal Force, and so the car would slip uncontrollably up the slope. Okay, so in this problem we've got a conical pendulum constructed from light string with a small bob on the end of mass 0.5 kilograms. Okay, so here it is, we've got an mg force pulling it down and there'll be a tension force pulling it up and it makes some angle with the vertical here. The string has a length of one meter. Okay, so this shows the forces. We've also got that this is one meter. And the bob travels with a speed of 1.0 meters per second. And we want to know what angle does the string make with the vertical? Okay, so this question's actually a little bit challenging. So we can start by considering the forces. These two forces are going to add together to give our centripetal force, which is this way, and it's got a magnitude mv squared on r. So we can write that the horizontal component of the tension force, so T sine theta, is equal to mv squared on r. And we can also consider the vertical forces. We've got that T cos theta is equal to mg. So from this one here, we can write, well, T is equal to mg on cos theta. And now we can substitute this into here. So we've got mg times sine theta over cos theta is equal to mv squared on r. So cancelling these m's, we've got sine theta on cos theta is equal to v squared over rg. Okay. So that's one equation. Unfortunately, we can't solve this right now because we don't know what R is. So let's go back to this displacement diagram here. This is the radius. This is the length. We do know the length. From this diagram here, this is LR, we can write sine theta is equal to opposite, which is R, over hypotenuse, which is L. So here we can write, well, R is equal to L sine theta, and we do know L. So we can say, well, this is equal to V squared over L sine theta G. So rearranging this, we've got sine squared theta over cos theta is equal to V squared over LG. And then doing some trigonometry and remembering that sine squared theta plus cos squared theta is equal to 1, we can write, well, this is equal to 1 minus cos squared theta over cos theta, which is equal to v squared on LG. Now let's cross multiply. I'm going to go up here. And so we've got LG minus LG cos squared theta is equal to v squared cos theta. So we can write this as LG cos squared theta plus v squared cos theta minus lg is equal to zero. And now what we have is a quadratic equation in terms of cos squared theta. So we can now use our quadratic formula, which is minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a to find cos theta. So cos theta is going to be equal to minus b, which is minus v squared plus or minus the square root of v squared minus 4ac. So we've got a negative here, so that negative will cancel that negative. So we'll end up with 4 and then a times c, that's l squared g squared, 
divided by 2a, which is 2lg. Okay, now these things we do all know. So we can now substitute in and find theta. So we've got minus 1 squared plus or minus the square root of 1 squared plus 4 times 9.8 squared times 1 squared, because L is 1, divided by 2 times 9.8 times 1. And so this is equal to 18.6 over 2 times 9.8, which is equal to 0 0.95. So now we can solve for theta, taking the inverse cos of this, and we get theta is equal to 18.1 degrees. So we've finally gotten there. But let's just present the final answer with two significant figures. So this is 18 degrees. So we've solved that problem.